Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I'm Ian, one of the vets from the Animal Veterinary Service. And today, we have two vet specialists with us here today, Dr. Jessica Lee from Mandai Nature and Dr. Trent Charles from Jurong Bird Park. So Dr. Jessica Lee will be telling us more about what to look out for before owning a pet bird, as well as what, as what it means to be a responsible pet bird owner. And Dr. Trent will be telling us more about bird welfare, bird health, and bird care. And also today with us, we have some very special guests, pet bird owner Eugene, as well as his two pet parrots, Odin and Toby, are here too. And he will be asking Dr. Jessica and Dr. Trent some questions later. If you have any questions, please feel free to write them down in the comments section below, and we'll get back to you after the webinar. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass the time now to Dr. Jessica. Thank you, Dr. Ian. Thank you to everyone out there who's tuning in with us this morning. So I'll just get started on our presentation. So um, I'm, I'm Jess, I'm from Mandai Nature, and we've got Trent here from the Jerome Bird Park um, under the new, newly rebranded Mandai Wildlife Group, which was originally Wildlife Reserve Singapore. And Dr. Ian already gave you a brief breakdown, but essentially I'll be covering the first third of the presentation. I'll be talking a bit about knowing your bird, as well as the things you need to think about before you go ahead and buy a bird if you're a new owner, or if buying more birds if you're an existing owner. After which, Dr. Trent will take over to talk about bird care and touch on aspects on health as well as welfare. Okay, so a little bit about me. I started my bird journey back in 2007. Um, I'm a avian conservation biologist with a para-veterinary background, and now I work for Mandai Nature and oversee their avian species programs and partnerships across Southeast Asia, but also in Singapore. So I believe birds can be our teachers, and you know, just by looking at a bird, you can kind of tell um, what it needs and how to care for it. So let's go through some of the key pointers, and the list isn't exhaustive, um, there's obviously more. I've chosen to just highlight some key points and touch on really broad concepts to get yourself thinking. So as you all know, birds have feathers. Um, it's one of their main characteristics. So that tells us that, you know, feathers are there to keep a bird warm. So temperature is really important for a bird, right? The ambient temperature and, and where you keep them. Birds have wings, another key trait. So that tells you flight is really important because they fly and also space because you need space for them to fly. Now, they have a growing beak, right? So this beak is always growing, and it comes in different shapes and sizes and forms. And that tells you different birds have different diets, but also you need to help maintain those beaks by giving them certain implements in their cage, right? They allow them to do so. To fly, they have very lightweight bones. And that means that you need to be really careful when you're holding a bird because if you exert too much pressure, you can actually damage the bird quite badly. Birds are quite small. They have really high metabolism to fuel their high activity. Once more, rounding back to space, food being really, really important um, in their care. In nature, many species occur in flocks. Um, what does that tell you? Well, social interactions either between birds or with their owner is really important for your welfare. In nature as well, most birds tend to be prey animals, so they're quite flighty. Um, on a whole, where possible, try to minimize disturbance if you have a bird. And finally, another ad adaptation for flight is really well-developed lungs. And that also indicates air quality is really important because they're really, really sensitive to changes in air. Okay, so let's just touch on some concepts. Um, this also helps you know your bird a bit more. If you have a bird, to think about what, what bird you actually have. So I'll be talking about uh, things like domestication, taming versus wild. Now, what is domestication? Domestication comes from this Latin word domesticus, which essentially means belonging to the house. And uh, a domesticated species or animal, essentially is an animal that has been bred selectively um, to have traits that makes them tolerant of people and respond calmly in the presence of, of people. And these traits are quite often a genetic, genetic, permanent genetic change in an animal. And, and we, call, we call these animals domesticated species. Um, now, domestication is not the same as taming. Because why? Taming is more of a condition, right? It's, a, it's your conditioning of it to change its behavior in a way that it responds calmly in the presence of people. So ultimately, at the end of both of them, you get a really really nice bird in the presence of people who's tolerant to humans. But one is through a genetic breeding change, one is through, and the second, taming, is through a behavioral change. And the last thing, which is the opposite, right, is, the, is wild. So wild can mean two things. Wild could mean a wild form, a wild type, a wild species, so a bird that is not domesticated. It could also mean wild behavior, so a bird that, you know, freaks out in the cage and all that. 
Okay, so let's just touch on two examples of, you know, one domestic example and one wild example. Here in this, in this slide, we have a bird on the left, that's a rock dove, that's a wild type. Scientific name is Columba livia. It has been domesticated into a domestic form. And once that happens, right, we add the word, I mentioned domest domesticus in, in Latin, we add it at the end of that species name, so it becomes Columba livia domestica. And that is the domestic pigeon. The picture on the right with all the birds, I, those, those birds are all the same bird, right? That's actually the domestic pigeon. It's just been bred to be in different forms of colors, shapes, and sizes. So you cannot say, in the picture on the right, those are all different species. They're actually all different breeds because we're talking about a domestic animal and not a wild animal. Now an example of a wild um, pet bird is the Gordian finch. Now you notice the scientific name, um, Chloribia gaudiae, right? Uh, and the picture on the left, you have three birds. The Gordian finch exists in the wild in three color forms or color morphs or mutations, have you heard it? A red face, a yellow, and a black face. The picture on the right shows you all the captive forms of that bird, right? And they come in all different colors, but they're all the same shape, they're all the same bird. The only difference is a color. And what people often say here is these are different color morphs or mutations. Note at the, at the bottom of that picture, the scientific name hasn't changed. It's still Chloribia gaudier. So we're talking about a bird that's still wild, right? It's just been bred to a different color form. So it's just one, one change in the bird, and that is color. And in captivity, you also see other versions of birds in the form of hybrids. And a hybrid essentially is when you breed two different species. You get an, uh, a bird, and that is a mix of both species. This example here is a hybrid between a zebra finch on the left and owl finch on the right. And you can see the bird in the middle, the baby, has characteristic traits from both of its parents, the stripes from its you know, dad and the other face and shape from its mom. So now we'll go into the types of things you really need to think about before you um, keep a bird or keep more birds. Firstly, bird care is a long-term responsibility. Many birds live to really long. Macaws, for example, easily 70, 80 years of age. So if you're going to buy a bird and keep one, you're in it for the long haul. Birds tend to do this thing where um, they hide their weakness or illness, right? So it's really hard to recognize abuse, neglect, and even sickness in a bird. Why? Because if they were to show this in the wild, they'll show they're weak or sick in the wild, they'll be either picked up by predators really easily all be ostracized by their flock, right? Because a flock doesn't want a predator hanging around. So they tend to hide. We call it masking their, themselves. And usually once the signs are visible, it's too late. And, and Dr. Trent later on will talk a bit more, right, about uh, bird care and health. So boils down to my final point, really need to know your bird, which is really important. So you can tell, you know, this slight changes in behavior when, you know, when you sense they're not doing really well. And this is my last slide. So it's really to get you to think about what, you know, some, some considerations people don't really think about before they buy a bird. First thing is the most important question, I think, is why do you even want a bird, right? Um, what are your motivations for keeping it? Is it because I watched a YouTube video of a very cute budgie, um, you know, that, or a cockatoo that's acting or dancing really cute? Now, many pet owners will tell you the cockatoo is only cute for 10 seconds, and the remaining 50 seconds, 59 minutes, and 23 hours, the bird is screaming. So, yeah, think twice before you, you do buy a bird. Do you have the right resources to actually keep a bird? Bird health care is not cheap. If you want to give a bird the right diet, it's also not, it's, it can be quite costly. Do you have the space and the time to even have a bird? Have you done the right research before, you know, the kind of species that you can work with? Are there lifestyle sacrifices you're willing to make? Uh, now, if you, once you have a bird at home, you can forget about scented candles, smoking at home, air fresheners, because all these things are not good for birds. Are your family and housemates bird friendly? For example, uh, do they have allergies or, you know, do they not like the noise? These are some questions. So it's not a decision you can make on your own. If you do live with people, it becomes a group decision as to whether or not a bird should be another member of the household. And, and the second, and I think a really important point is what is your conservation status of your bird and trait, trait status? Is your bird really, really threatened a while? And, you know, in terms of trait status, do you have the right paperwork to keep the bird or buy the bird? And the last question is, is there a plan B? So what happens is everything fails and you need to get rid of the bird. What next? Many people don't, don't often have a plan B and they, they release the bird into the wild, which is illegal. So like I said, bottom line, think twice before you keep a bird. And over to you, Dr. Trent. Great. Thanks for that, Jess. Yep. So guys, just want to basically quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Trent. I am a veterinarian at Jurong Bird Park and Mandai Wildlife Group. 
We are um, involved in the uh, care and maintenance of the uh, avian species at uh, the park, as well as looking after wildlife um, that are brought in sick or injured. Um, huge passion for a long time as an avian vet the last five years um, and working at Jurong the last uh, two years. I love birds, love reptiles, and uh, love getting these animals back into tip-top condition. So we'll go over basically today a few facts about bird uh, care and husbandry, um, how to do the best by your pet, <clears throat> as well as looking at um, how to uh, address any health concerns in your birds and um, making sure they're given the optimal welfare when we keep them in our homes. So the first thing we want to cover is um, caging for birds. So um, when we look at cage size, the bigger the better. Um, offer the largest space you can possibly provide your pet. Um, just because it's a very small bird doesn't mean that it needs to be kept in a very small cage. Um, and there's no real one size that can fit all. Um, some people give specific dimensions for certain species, but at the end of the day, you should be offering the most space that you can provide for your um, pet at home. Uh, you need to think carefully about the design and construction of the cage, you know, choosing a cage with appropriate wire spacing for uh, the species you've got so it cannot fit its head through the bars, um, as well as considering you know, longer cages are generally better than very tall cages because birds fly horizontally much better than they fly completely vertically. Okay. Where we position the cage in the house is also important. So having birds uh, indoors or outdoors, uh, they can be housed either way. Important considerations when we're um, doing both, including thinking about um, things like safety if they're housed outside uh, or safety when they're housed inside, you know, not giving the birds access to things like uh, cables or bathrooms where they can fall into water sources and potentially become trapped and injured. Okay. Uh, perches, most birds perch on... Um, surfaces and, and branches in the wild. So in our homes, we want to provide these guys with perches that are basically going to uh, fit the, the size of the feet. Normally something that as a standard baseline uh, fits two thirds of the, um, the foot around the perch uh, is optimal. But offering a variety of perches, particularly natural branches uh, where they can wear their nails down and um, stretch and, and flex those muscles in the feet is really important. Providing an uh, area for the bird, if they're a tame bird particularly, to come out and uh, interact with the environment safely around them. So jungle gyms, play stands, uh, where the birds can uh, feel comfortable and be safe uh, and engage in a different environment from their cage. Things we want to consider is um, probably best to avoid using the happy huts, which are sort of soft fabric uh, triangles or circles for the birds to go and nest in. Unfortunately, they do really want to nest in these quite often, and that can promote some aggressive behaviour, and they can rip them apart and ingest the fibres and potentially get um, gastrointestinal obstructions. And then also consider whether um, using chains or not. These are generally ill-advised only because um, there are some risks to the bird injuring itself with uh, a chain attached to their leg. Most parrots are not equipped to handle being yanked or jerked on a chain, and they can't escape something that might come and try and get them on that perch if it is used. Um, so probably best to take that into careful consideration before using them. In the photos you can see I've got a picture of my uh, green wing macaws uh, room <laughs> where he had his sleeping cage, uh, a jungle gym for playing on, as well as a tea stand for training. And a friend of mine, uh, Angeline, with her quail and set up, excellent design for uh, the species where they've got a sand bath, bird safe um, plants, and uh, beautiful viewing and foraging opportunities inside that enclosure. When we think about our birds, another very important thing to consider is what we're going to feed them. Birds uh, eat a variety of different things depending on the species. There's granivores, as with uh, a lot of our parrots like cockatoos and pudgies. We've got insectivores, like uh, white eyes that like to eat uh, small bugs and other insects throughout the day. Frugivores, things like our uh, eclectus parrots and our toucans that like to eat uh, primarily fruits. And nectivores such as lorikeets that will uh, feed on blossoms and nectar um, from flowers. So when we have these guys, we want to offer a combination of formulated and fresh diets. Uh, there are a number of great um, pelleted diets out there for um, pre-prepared for parrots, uh, including of different species and, and nutritional requirements. And then mixing up fresh foods like uh, vegetables, fruits, um, other greens and sprouts uh, into that as well, and as well as some seeds for those species that uh, would normally eat them. <coughs> so the way we present our food and water is very important. Certain birds um, require different uh, levels of activity, engagement with their food. A lot of parents would spend their whole day foraging in the wild, so we want to allow for that in captivity. It keeps them 
uh, busy when we're not around and helps stimulate that natural behaviour they'd otherwise um, engage in. And where we need to consider what sort of foods that we're offering them as well. Um, some foods are, are toxic, such as avocado, onion, rhubarb, chocolate, caffeine, alcohol. All these things should be avoided because they can um, be a life-threatening risk to your pet. Um, but also knowing that sometimes sharing foods with our pet birds is okay with more land items, such as some breads and um, uh, crackers or, or rice. But if we've added a lot of salt or sugar to these foods, we shouldn't really be sharing it with our pets. <laughs> yeah, we really shouldn't. So for our cage and uh, hygiene, uh, we need to think about the way that we clean our birds' um, houses. So we need to have a substrate that will greatly affect the, the cleanliness of the cage. So if the floor is um, made of wire, such as in this photo, uh, we find that those cages are very easy to keep very clean. But there is a bit of a compromise that the bird may not be able to dig or forage around in the, um, the cage base as they normally would. So we need to uh, offer other, some solutions for that if we choose this type of design enclosure. Um, food and water needs to be prepared fresh twice a day, so morning and night, don't let it stagnate over 24 hours. Okay? Nectar birds, uh, nectar eaters such as lorries need to be given fresh food um, or replace, take out nectar uh, within two to three hours because that liquid diet can spoil very easily. Uh, for cage cleaning, uh, we really want to be looking at changing the feces, uh, feces soaked um, paper at least uh, once a day um, and then scrubbing the cage down about a week, every week and then giving a thorough disinfect or replacing our perches every month. Um, for disinfectants, there's a range that are very safe out there, um, and it's just about researching which brand is going to be most appropriate for um, birds that you can access easily. Now, routine care and maintenance. Um, most of these things, like uh, nail trims, wing clips, um, need to be considered when we have our pets. Um, you know, if a bird is kept optimally, nail trimming can be kept to an absolute minimum, um, but we just need to regularly assess our birds every day to make sure that they're not getting overgrown. Um, for all these grooming procedures, the bird will normally be, need to be restrained. If you're very confident um, and have seen it done many times before, nail trimming is okay to do um, in the confines of your home, but normally this will require um, veterinary assistance, at least in the onset when first trying. Um, and for wing clipping, uh, it's something that needs to be decided personally based on your circumstances and what your um, a situation, living situation with your pet is. So if it's going to be done um, to prevent the bird injuring itself or, or escaping um, in certain uh, contexts, it needs to be done correctly. So that definitely should require uh, veterinary attention when uh, completing it. Bathing and showering our birds. Uh, look, this is something that should be done for almost all cases for our pets. Um, and so offering um, a shower either by spraying uh, a mister on the bird or by taking them to, into the shower if they really enjoy it. Uh, with uh, lightly warmed water, or potentially um, giving them a bath to bathe in. And this can be done uh, up to every day if they really love it, but otherwise a couple of times a week should suffice. <clears throat> Access to ultraviolet light is very important for our um, pets. They normally would have high exposure in the wild, so we want to provide them with uh, either some outdoor time every day or a UV light over the uh, enclosure that's regularly replaced, as well as looking, providing lots of enrichment every day, fresh stuff, keep it uh, new and change it regularly. So offering um, fresh branches and browse, offering safe toys for the bird to interact with and giving them those foraging opportunities we talked about earlier. So birds in the home environment. So we want to look at um, really considering, especially before we bring birds into our home or when things change, are the interactions between birds and family members. Kids behave very differently from adults and so uh, the fast movements and uh, unpredictability of children can make birds uh, quite scared of them. Or the opposite, as you just seen in the photo, where the kids can be a bit scared of our, our birds as well. Um, as well as when we're keeping more than one bird, we need to consider that um, you know there are potential risks involved and the size of different birds matter. Mixing different sizes can be uh, risky if they're not introduced very early. Um, and the age of the bird at introduction can have a big impact on how tolerant they are to a new um, family member coming in as well as correct introduction methods, so making sure that birds are introduced in a neutral environment, uh, often with cages side by side first, and then taking them out together in a uh, supervised manner, uh, very slow and gradually. Around other pets, we need to be very careful about this. So mixing birds with um, dogs, cats, or other small mammals, this can pose a lot of risks, and certainly with nothing, uh, you know, like uh, fish or other sorts of pets, because we don't want um, any potential risks either side. 
and uh, birds are very delicate, can be badly injured by our um, uh, mammal pets like dogs and cats. So the other things we also want to consider, we're talking about lifestyle changes before, <clears throat> household hazards are a real um, potential threat and we may need to make some major changes in the house. The photo I've included of those plants, very popular over here, um, the philodendrons. Philodendrons are highly toxic to birds if they're ingested and um, normally need to be kept away from where your bird has access to, um, as well as considering other toxins, so things like tobacco, Teflon, uh, no smoking in the house, no cooking with non-stick fry pans because uh, the fumes from these can um, be very life-threatening uh, to birds and straight away as well. So, <coughs> handling and training. So, number one thing with pet birds is um, positive reinforcement is the key. Um, it's the most successful method for interacting with our pets. Um, basically, it's all about uh, rewarding good behaviour and ignoring bad behaviour with, with birds. And this builds up the, the foundation of trust that we can do more and more um, with our pets once we start engaging in them this way. Okay, and making sure that um, it sort of allows us to handle them when we need to uh, restrain the bird for special um, care or, or treatment. And we really need to never ever physically punish birds when they don't do what we want them to. The main reason being that we really do predispose to severe injury. Um, you know, they're, they're quite delicate as we discussed and it takes away that trust and promotes um, unwanted behavioral problems with our pets. <clears throat> with pet parrots, um, time commitment is a really important thing. So we need to consider that, especially large species, you know, three to four hours of supervised outside of cage time every day um, with few limitations in the conditions that we can be flexible on this um, needs to be adhered to. And then giving them about an hour or so of direct um, interaction, the bird sitting with you, training with you, you know, doing stuff uh, directly with you at that point, really, really important um, to make sure that they get that social interaction they crave and need. <clears throat> right, so when we're working through difficult behaviours, um, this often uh, pops up with our pet parrots particularly, uh, and you know, uh, we don't want to end up like the guy in the top where he's uh, getting chomped by his African grey, um, but you know, different behaviours, uh, there are lots of ways to address these concerns. So chewing in parrots um, is very, very normal behaviour. They normally do a lot of it in the wild on, on fresh browse. So really the easiest way to correct that is to give them lots of appropriate options and supervise our birds when they're outside the cage. Screaming, um, <clears throat> mostly again a problem of parrots and um, some other species. Understand that this is definitely a normal behaviour depending on the context. Um, for birds, it's a normal way they communicate. Um, <clears throat> number one rule is do not scream back. We don't want to be screaming back at our birds and reward always the quiet behaviours and the whistling and talking that we like to hear and ignore the, uh, the screaming noises that we don't want to hear. Biting behaviour, so making sure that our uh, birds, we understand why they're biting. So it can be a young baby exploring, it could be a fear related bite, um, or it could be hormonal um, directed aggression against a perceived threat. Or it could be displaced biting on you if they see something they don't like on the other side of the room. So knowing how that this behaviour is started and the triggers to it is extremely important. And then redirecting that behaviour um, and controlling the circumstances on which it comes about will be paramount to reducing the frequency it happens. And as they become less frequent in exhibiting the biting, uh, the less likely it's going to keep happening in future. <clears throat> We're working through feather picking really complex problem and we want to rule out all possible medical concerns um, and ensure that these guys are given really appropriate daily care um, and enrichment opportunities um, in order to uh, fulfil some of the, the needs that uh, may be occurring and missing to promote this feather picking. You can see in the photo I have on the bottom, a cockatoo is being stroked and petted. That's basically a direct communication to that cockatoo that um, you're my mate and we should go and settle down and make a nest. Uh, if we're demonstrating this, Unfortunately, what can happen is that uh, they get frustrated when we don't do those things we expect them to do after all the petting um, and they start to pluck and pull those feathers out. <clears throat> so a really important question is how do we know if the bird we have or we're looking to get is healthy? Ways we can do that is uh, looking at uh, visiting a veterinarian to get a health assessment on our pets. So uh, when should we take our birds to the vet? We need to think about taking them when we've... Um, either just purchase the bird or as an annual health check to make sure that uh, their, their health is kept up to date. Right? So uh, why do we take them? Definitely number one is to treat uh, any potential illnesses that crop up in um, our birds and it's an important part of the main duty of care that we have when looking after them. Right? 
The um, other things that we uh, need to do when we take them to the vet is it allows us to identify as a part of our annual health check any potential uh, issues and stop them becoming a major health concern before it happens, okay? It can help uh, in preventative medicine as well. The other thing we need to look at is uh, appropriately screening for any disease sources. Um, so especially when we're adding new birds to a flock, um, you know, making sure that they don't come with or we don't already have uh, infectious diseases that could make them very ill. Um, and then the last part is we can receive the latest updates and information on what the best standards of care are for our pets um, from a veterinary aspect. Okay? And there are a number of options here in Singapore and it's all just a matter of um, doing your research and looking for a, uh, a vet that proposes they're comfortable with looking after birds. <clears throat> so when we take our bird to the vet, what do we expect? Um, the vet will generally start with a thorough history. Uh, so they will review the current care the, and the way that the bird's looked after. Because uh, husbandry that we provide can greatly impact the, um, the overall health and the, the, the way that our bird um, is, is given adequate welfare. Okay? Looking for potential stressors in the environment and, and potential things that can uh, stress the bird out. When we are stressed or when our pets are stressed, our immune system is uh, impeded and, and uh, immunocompromised. So, uh, we want to reduce these potential stresses. So if we look at the bottom photo in that uh, slide that I've put up here, that banded pitta um, is almost definitely a wild bird and it's been confined to a very small wooden cage. That bird would be under immense stress and very prone to falling sick very quickly and very easily. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then we need to look for our potential sources of infection okay, or, or potential sources of the problem and offer suggestions um, for improved care. Okay, So with birds that have... Um, you know, any uh, changes in their history or, or concerns in their history, we can directly address some of those and uh, recommend improved means of, of making sure they're kept well in. All right, so physical examination will generally come next. So this is basically where we um, directly assess the bird's um, overall health and physical state. So we observe the bird in its pet carrier uh, or the way it's brought to the vet clinic. And in doing so, what we're gonna be doing is making sure that um, we get an idea of how they normally behave, as just touched on earlier. Uh, birds tend to hide or mask their illness um, if they're stressed out. So giving them a chance away from us to observe them in a more natural state is going to provide a more accurate assessment of how they're really feeling. Okay? Uh, and then we can as require uh, restraining them to assess them thoroughly. So we'll have to catch the bird and then um, physically hold it to give it a full exam. Um, the best way to make this less stressful when the bird comes to the vet is to get them desensitized to being um, around towels or having towels put over them because this will make it a much less stressful process for the bird in our hands. Okay. Once we've um, got the bird out, we'll check them from head to toe um, and look at every aspect of their uh, physical state uh, and identify any abnormalities and then we start to hone in on those potential concerns and problems. You can see in the video there, I've got a very well behaved uh, umbrella cockatoo assisting me in uh, taking a physical exam. Um, and you can see how this can be done in a very non-stressful manner in a bird that is well adjusted and used to being in a towel, okay? It's really not worried at all. He almost thinks that this is a, a very uh, comfortable, uh, happy process to be assessed there. So, next we'll start to decide if any um, further testing needs to be done for our pets. So, um, we'll look at, uh, there's a set of different uh, checks that are done as standard for most birds as overall wellness assessment. So number one being a fecal check, um, looking at both the, what we call the gross appearance or the overall appearance of the feces itself. So we assess whether there's any blood, diarrhea, undigested food that could indicate potential problems. Um, we will then perform a microscopic exam on the feces. And then we're looking at the parasite burden in the bird, any evidence of um, particles or fibers and um, blood or other cells that shouldn't be there. Okay. We then might look at taking a crop sample from the bird. So this little budgie's helping us out in this image here. Um, he's allowing us to get a little fluid wash out of the crop. Um, they need to be restrained for this. There's no way it can be done uh, automatically, um, but it's done very quickly, very safely. And we look for potential infections in the upper gastrointestinal tract, as well as for any foreign particles that shouldn't be there. The last thing that we often will do is, is take a blood sample. And this can be done very safely. We only need a very small volume from birds in order to uh, get an adequate result. Uh, and we're looking for potential signs of infection, fever, um, or any other organ diseases. Okay. So those are the main checks. But if need be, there are more um, tests that 
uh, can be done. Um, the thing is that uh, it used to be viewed that birds were very hard to assess physically and, and treat uh, in, in a medicine context, but with the advances in, in our capabilities these days, uh, there's a huge range of tests and diagnostics that can be performed, much like in human medicine. So we can take x-rays and perform CT uh, on birds, even things like MRI. And what we're looking here is for disorders of um, the bird's overall health um, in, in terms of bone or skeletal abnormalities, masses, any foreign bodies that might be present, or other organ-related uh, uh, changes or issues. Okay. Uh, but birds will generally require sedation to do this, so they may spend the day at the vet for that procedure. We can take certain swabs looking for um, the disease's uh, DNA uh, or the host's or the bird's response to that um, infection that they may have. And so we can pick up on things like uh, avian chlamydia, viral diseases, uh, or mycobacteria uh, very simply through swab tests. Then when we're talking about um, uh, looking for very specific problems, um, either on the skin or uh, within inside the body. We can take samples with a needle for cytology or take a whole biopsy from a lesion um, and look under the microscope at what that problem might be. We can uh, perform endoscopy and celioscopy just as we could in humans and other pets. Um, so you can see a photo looking at the reproductive organs and kidney of a female. You can see she's got ovaries there, female um, parrot. Uh, and this can help us to get a very good overview of a particular problem as well as biopsy particular samples. And for in cases when a bird is tragically lost, we can perform a post-mortem examination um, and check if there were any specific um, causes that could indicate um, you know, potential threats or risks to our other birds at home. What else can we consider with our um, pet birds? We need to, uh, at vet clinics, help with Grooming. So, as I said before, if we're not sure about how the bird is uh, going to manage um, being groomed at home, generally the best bet is to bring them to a vet clinic and have this uh, performed uh, by a vet. So, nail trimming and wing clipping can be done there. Um, the sex determination of birds, uh, for species that are monomorphic or the males and females look the same, uh, we can basically check their um, sex by taking a blood or feather sample um, or by directly scoping them, as shown in that previous image. Right? Uh, microchipping, this can be performed uh, at a vet clinic. It's generally done under sedation because it is painful, but they go home with a little bit of pain relief and very comfortable afterwards. Uh, and it's a really good means of permanent identification beyond leg rings. Okay? And we also are able to provide uh, tips and, and assist with that geriatric and end of life care for our pet birds. Well, that pretty much brings me to the end of uh, my section. Thanks everyone for your time. Nice back to it. Thank you very much, Dr. Trent, for the very informative session. Our special guests are waiting for us. Pet bird owner Eugene and his two pet parrots, Odin and Toby, are here. Let's go and say hi to them. Sounds good. Right. So, hi Eugene, um, can you tell us more about the two little friends we have here today? Hi everyone, so this is Toby. Toby is a male Eclectus parrot and he is currently 10 years old. And the small one over the perch here, this is Odin. Odin is a female yellow-sided corneal and this year she is 11 years old. Okay, um, thanks Eugene for introducing your birds. And enough about the birds, uh, let's go over to the owner. Eugene, could you maybe tell us, you know, um, what motivated you to bird keeping? Right, so since young, I had, uh, I've always been in love with animals. So my first pet was actually a pet terrapin. And then I went on to keep uh, fishes till date. And now I have my pet parrots with me. Cool. And, um, you know, I, I have five rescue birds at home and I believe in bird adoptions. Um, but I had to make lifestyle changes when it came to keeping birds. So maybe you could share with the audience, right, if there were any lifestyle changes you had to do at home, right, um, to welcome your two feathered friends. Right. Right. So, uh, how they've impacted my, my life is, of course, having them with me has brought joy to myself as well as my family. Um, they can be very fun to be with, they, uh, and they're also very affectionate to their owners. But uh, because they can have a very long lifespan, so uh, you have to be ready to take care of them for a long period of time. So, 
keeping a parrot or owning a parrot can be a lifetime commitment. As well as the noise that they can produce, uh, it's best that if you could allocate a room to them so that when they start to shout or scream throughout the day, at least you have a room to put them in, close all your windows and doors to keep the noise level down so that you can have peace for your, for your surrounding areas. Yeah. Cool. And Eugene, I noticed that uh, Toby's missing a few feathers around his neck. Uh, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about uh, what's going on there? Right, so uh, if you can see, Toby has this uh, scrappy look around the neck area. So uh, this is because he has this feather plucking issue. So what happened was, uh, since young he was living in this house for many, many years and subsequently we had to relocate Toby to a new location. So after this relocation, I started to notice uh, some behavior changes in him. So at the base of his cage, uh, started to appear these down feathers as well as the newly developed feathers. And over time, I even noticed pin feathers on the base of the cage, which are the new feathers that is supposed to be growing out of him. Uh, initially, I thought he was going through a molting phase, but actually this was the start of this, his feather plucking issue. I've tried various methods uh, to curb this habit of his. For example, I've increased his uh, fresh diet to have more fresh vegetables and fruits. I even changed some of the pellets that he was eating. And I've also added feather supplements to incite new feather growth. I've also tried adding a neck collar onto him. Uh, that was for about a month. And after removing the neck collar, uh, his plucking still continued. And I've also added more foraging toys in his cage. Uh, so that I can hope that he will have uh, he will have put more attention to the foraging toys rather than destructing his own feathers. And finally, I've also tried to shower him frequently in this pet-friendly Nimoy water mix. Uh, so despite all the efforts that I put in, his plucking persisted. So I would like to ask Dr. Tran, in such an instance, how would you manage a bird with this plucking behavior? Yeah, absolutely. No, it sounds like uh, you've really put a lot of thought into this, Eugene, and, and certainly done your research, which is extremely important in any aspect of care for our pet parrots. Um, you know, feather plucking, as we touched on before, it's one of the most complex uh, conditions to work through uh, in a veterinary aspect and for the uh, homeowner as well. Okay, it's um, stressful for all involved, um, but uh, you've really done a great job. I love that you're giving him increased foraging opportunities as well as uh, trying to uh, engage with him that way. So really, I think that uh, what we would normally do to work through a feather plucking issue, uh, we would first work on getting all the information on his history, right? We would sit you down and have a great big questionnaire to go through and we'll get every single detail of his care prior to the, um, the your purchase, as well as before the plucking started, at the time it started, and the care that he receives now. Um, Following on from that, we'd look at uh, taking a, a very thorough medical exam on, on Toby. So we would basically do a full thorough check, get some blood work done. We're looking for potential organ disorders. You know, pain can be a reason why birds will feather pluck, um, including organ pain like uh, liver, kidney, they might pluck in those areas. Um, skin irritation, um, parasitic infections, any of these things can contribute to it, right? So we'd want to do a very thorough exam on him. Uh, we want to review the diet very closely. So eclectus, um, as you know, they eat a lot of fruits in the wild, right? And that means they also have a very high vitamin A requirement in their diet. So we'd want to make sure that Toby's getting adequate vitamin A uh, as well as an overall appropriate diet that's not impacting his overall health in terms of liver especially. He's got a little bit of an overgrown tomia on his um, beak. And this can sometimes be an indication that uh, with uh, beak changes and feather changes, we might have an underlying liver compromise, okay? So we'd look at that as well. Um, we'd find out more about the way that you're interacting with Toby at home. So is he getting a lot of that hormonal triggering petting and, and handling? Uh, as we discussed earlier, that stroking and touching of the uh, pet parrot uh, can really encourage some of those hormonal changes to occur uh, and result in this fellow becoming uh, frustrated for any of those hormonal reasons, okay? Uh, the other thing that we might want to do is engage in a lot more um, turning and, and um, uh, getting... Yeah, there's so much to go on about with feather flicking, isn't there? Uh, we'd want to engage in a lot of um, uh, positive reinforcement training. So getting him to interact with you and, and other family members in a different way um, and encouraging that uh, social interaction with lots of people in the house um, as Eclectus really love. 
And then the other side of uh, this would be uh, understanding if we get to a point that it's not medical, um, it's behavioural confirmed, and there are no easy ways to control it, uh, and everything we're putting in place isn't changing it a lot, we have to understand that maybe we won't be able to get this um, completely eliminated, but if we've added all these foraging opportunities, we've addressed any of the behavioural concerns, um, and he's otherwise very well, there may be uh, an acceptable level that we have to just sort of tolerate and work with. You know, feather picking is likened to obsessive compulsive disorder in humans, right? So uh, working with that compulsion uh, takes a long time and it's, we're definitely got to be in it for the long haul to work with. But that would be the uh, main steps that we'd approach um, and hopefully we can work on this with Toby shortly. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Eugene. And it was very nice to meet you both, um, Toby and Odin. So now we have our Q&A session. If you have any questions, please write them down in the comments section below. Okay, so welcome to the Q&A section of the webinar. We have our first question today from Noor Hakima Ali. So she asks, how to make yellow crowned Amazon parrot to be social around people? I brought my pet bird to the vet only once, as I find that she's very stressful during the check. She's not social to people that she doesn't recognize and is very clingy to her owners. So since that vet trip, she has refused to be put inside the carrier bag. And before that, she's been quite willing to be in there, as that means a walk at the park, which she enjoys as long as there's not a lot of pe people. However, since that vet trip, she has refused to... That might be all that... Uh, that may be all the question. Fit on the, yeah. the question. <laughs> yep, that's okay. Yeah, go ahead, Trent. You can take cool. this one. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So, um, no, basically uh, working through uh, either overbonding issues or, um, you know, socialization concerns with parrots, uh, it, it is a challenge. It really is. Um, a lot of our pet parrots naturally would spend some time in a flock but not be very close with a lot of flock members, but they'll uh, be very closely bonded to one other um, parrot in that group. And working through this in captivity is a challenge because our birds can become overbonded to the point they don't trust anyone around them uh, and they can then be prone to either aggression with other people or severe fear responses around other people. The main thing is, is to start very slow, okay? Uh, don't overwhelm the bird because the more you overwhelm them with a lot of new experiences all at once, the more scared they will become, okay? So start small, start slow getting a new person to come in the vicinity of um, your, your bird's cage uh, or in a neutral environment even better um, and engaging in not just um, uh, bringing the bird around people but actually interacting in a really positive, trustful manner. So using that positive reinforcement training, teaching birds to target for um, a clicker um, with you and then getting other people to do the same thing teaches our bird that I have this language, I speak with people uh, in terms of positive reinforcement, clicker training, um, and I can apply that to not just my owner, but with new people as well, okay? Uh, and the other thing is also to go very slowly um, with building up those new experiences and working with what she's comfortable. The best way with birds is often to introduce them to something new, a small thing, something new every single day, uh, because that's exactly what they do in the wild. We need to try and provide that to prevent them from getting too closed off from those new experiences. Okay, and for our next question, from Pup D Tech. Hi, I recently introduced a new budgie, I hand fed since four weeks old, to my existing budgie, currently nine months and tame. However, the interaction was one way, with my existing budgie, the rather excited one among them. After placing them together for one day, my new budgie turned aggressive towards the other and towards our finger. She kept squawking too. I have since had to separate them, but they often contact call each other. How do I handle such behaviors? So I can attempt to take that question. Um, well, I think one thing, what you could have done also, and this is for um, owners who are curious about this, is if you, do, if you are hand-rearing a really young bird, 
you could hand reared in the presence of another bird. So the, the birds are always looking at each other. Um, the entire time it's being hand reared. So they're used to each other, right, through the process. In that, in that way, you then minimize these types of issues. But now that you have a bird with an issue, and I'm guessing when you say new budgie, you mean that young bird that's aggressive. That is sometimes normal behavior because a young bird is often unsure. It's really new to the world. And would, it would tend to take aggressive stance towards new things, including other birds, and also to you as the owner. So our suggestion is to just keep playing with a bird, interacting with a bird, get, get the bird used to you. And also, if you want to you know, have both birds integrate together, do it with the other bird being there. So you could have the cage um, side by side, for example, and get him to in interact and get used to each other. OK. And we have another question from Erica Pei. Is it possible to train pet birds to identify where to defecate? Like training dogs and cats uh, to do their business <laughs> at specific places? Sort of. Mostly yes. <laughs> I, I, I got one of my birds, one of my five rescue birds is actually uh, trained to defecate. So she defecate, defecates off of edges, like off a table, yes. off the bed. Yes. So that it won't, you know, dirty my furniture or, you know, the bed, right? And then I'll just clean up the floor. So short answer, as Dr. Tran said, is yes. But it takes a lot of conditioning. And I must admit, not all birds seem to take to it very well. No. So they, they, not all birds you can expect the same behavior. But it's a lot of training yep. and rewarding if they do it in the right place. Um, and then obviously you don't reward them if they're pooping somewhere that you don't want them to poop. Yeah, it's tricky often with uh, small birds that defecate really frequently. They've got a very fast metabolism, so they poop a lot. So catching them and rewarding them for doing the defecating in the right spot every time is harder than with a big bird that goes less frequently, right? So you can often catch them and knowing what the signs of uh, normal, you know, your bird getting ready to do a poop, yeah. uh, knowing what that looks like is really important, cluing into that so that you can quickly take them to the spot that you want or yeah. encourage them over there and uh, give them the reward for doing it in the right spot. I know my macaw would always go to, there was a particular stand on his uh, cage when I had the door open. Um, he'd always fly back to that stand to defecate because he was always rewarded for being a good boy and going where he was meant to go. So definitely can be done, but it is, as yep. Jess said, hard work and takes a lot of patience. And our next question is from Eunice Ong. What is the crop? Oh, go ahead. sure. <laughs> the crop is basically an expansion of the esophagus that um, some birds, not all, a lot of birds will uh, use to store food. So some of the um, raptor species will, will have a crop. Birds with um, that like granivores, like our pet parrots and pigeons often have a crop so they can eat a lot of food in one go, store it there, and then it slowly passes down to the rest of their digestive tract. Um, and it's a, a place where we can uh, assess the uh, condition and health of the remainder of the digestive tract further down uh, quite simply and with very easy access. Hopefully that covers the question. Okay, and our next question is from Caroline Kelly. My budgie recently came down with parrot fever, which I'm still treating her for. She was super affectionate, but has gone back to biting <coughs> behaviors like before I tamed her. Do you know how I can help with this? Because it makes it very hard to interact, and I feel that the relationship isn't as good now. Okay. Yeah, that, that is a tough one. And, um, you know, it sounds like uh, she's needed a lot of treatment in order to recover from uh, her infection, and by parrot fever, I'm assuming probably means psittacosis, um, the chlamydia, uh, avian chlamydia, right now. Basically, with um, treatments for our pet birds, um, obviously they often need to be restrained in order to administer the medication they need to get better, but that can be really stressful and can be breaking of trust with our pets, okay? So um, even though she's required this to get through the and, and stay healthy and improve, what we need to do often is uh, try and slowly build up, you know, from the very start, just really tiny steps. So offering food or like a millet spray off by hand um, and slowly building up that trust and that confidence. Don't overdo it. It probably won't go back to the same way it was at the very start, but you can absolutely build back to where you guys were in terms of your relationship with um, your bird, okay? It's just going to take time and baby steps will get you much further than giant leaps. And our next question, we have it from Noor Hafiza. Can birds be microchipped? Yes. You again. Of yes, course. they definitely yep. can. Um, you know, birds, microchipping is an excellent way of permanently identifying your pet bird, making sure that if it is lost, it can always be uh, recovered and be confirmed as your pet, okay? Um, and they can be registered just like uh, our dogs and cats, okay? 
So microchipping, we generally do it for larger species um, routinely. So uh, anything sort of the size of you know, Toby the Eclectus up very regularly. Um, but smaller parrots can be done. But with very small birds, we just need to consider that um, you know it's a very big chip. Sometimes the easier way to identify very small parrots can be uh, through leg rings. But uh, the best bet is to uh, for your pet take it to the uh, your vet, and they can discuss the pros and cons of different identification means with you there. We have another question from Charlotte. I'm a new owner with two budgies. What should I feed them with? That's a, that's a really straightforward question. So um, there are many formulation of, of bird mixes and seeds for budgies, and really it's just about going to a bird shop, or even if you're really concerned and, and careful about your bird, going to the vet and getting them to rec recommend the types of brands that will be suited for your bird. It also boils down to how old your budgie is as well, um, but certainly not just seed mixes. Be sure to enrich its diet with, you know, fresh greens, fruits, and, you know, everything else, right? Um, yeah. I hope that answers the question. And we have another question from Zi Jen. How do we ta tackle separation anxiety for conures, and what is the best diet for them? Wow, that's a tough one. Yeah, <laughs> definitely two parts to that yeah. uh, question there. And certainly, separation anxiety is... Um, so often a symptom of being very overbonded with our pets, and this is a very easy thing to do. I, I know because I've been guilty of it, uh, where we, um, you know, spend so much time invested into our birds, but we don't teach them to be resourceful on their own. Um, and this is actually it has to be kind of a learnt skill in most birds, right? Uh, they're used to being in large groups and having contact with others uh, throughout their whole day and the night. So being on their own is not something that birds often are equipped with at the beginning. Um, but they have to because we can't be with them 24-7 in most circumstances. So teaching them to play and actually playing with the bird with toys and then leaving them for short periods to engage on their own is really important. We discussed earlier using foraging um, as a really, really important means for the bird to keep busy throughout the day. There are tools and toys that birds have to work through and they can spend a whole day working on these uh, different toys trying to get all the food they need and not actually feeding them out of food bowls but feeding them in uh, different various toys and, and plays and, and tra uh, trays and plates uh, in order for them to work for their food. When they're working for their food, they're kept busy, their mind is occupied, and they'll do much better than uh, a bird that's just given a simple food bowl that they can finish in 10 minutes, right? So this will keep them a lot busier. Um, then when it comes to uh, finding the ways that we interact with them, reducing the number of you know, physical contact. Connors love to be cuddled and scratched, but doing that all day long only builds that um, tension and stress when we leave them alone, okay? So engaging with them through training. Uh, so, you know, this is just a, a really neutral means of uh, playing with our bird, interacting with our bird, uh, rather than uh, cuddling and scratching is really beneficial and something I'd recommend very much so. As for the diet question, um, Conyers, you know, we, we, we would recommend giving them a, a mix of the formulated pelleted diets as well as lots of fresh fruits and greens, bean sprouts, um, you know, things like uh, a little bit of seed is okay, but not too much um, because we don't want them to gain too much weight. They are prone to obesity and captivity. Cool. Okay. And our next question is from Wayne. Are pet birds good for animal-assisted interactions or animal-assisted therapy activities? Wow. That's short a cool question. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good question. Um, short answer is I think, I think they do. Um, Birds, parrots tend to be very tactile, right? So what, what does that mean? It means they like to be touched, they like to interact socially. They're very social animals when they are brought up with the right welfare and care. Um, and I, I personally think um, that type of you know, disposition in an animal makes them exceptionally good um, to be used in therapy. And some birds can be trained to talk, whistle and sing. Many people find that behavior, the colors and the calls quite attractive. So. Certainly, I would, I would recommend a bird um, as therapy for people. It certainly is my therapy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, and our next question is from Priscilla. Nowadays, my lovebirds rather stay at the bottom of the cage rather than playing on the higher perch and coming out of the cage to play with us. Why is that so? They used to love coming out of the cage to play. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Like, it, it, there could be a number of things that could yeah. be uh, why your birds are, are choosing to spend their time in the bottom of the cage. If they're a pair of lovebirds and they don't have anywhere else to nest, there is a chance they might be trying to uh, 
form a bit of a nesting site at the bottom, okay? Birds yep. will nest on the ground if they're a bonded pair and they've got nowhere else to go. Yep. Um, the other thing that could be happening is that there may have been something scary that happened outside and they're just less inclined to want to go out. They feel more comfortable and safe in the cage, okay? Yep. The other thing that might be happening is they are truly just very comfortable in the enclosure and they find there's a lot of fun things to do on the floor, especially if you've got rolling balls and other toys down there. I'm sure they're quite happy to play down there. Another possibility may be that, you know, I hope not, but they might be sick, okay? Uh, we need to make sure that they're not down there because they're unwell, okay, and they're not able to perch or comfortable perching. So this may require potentially veterinary assessment and will require very close assessment from yourself on what their behaviour is now compared to how it was before to make sure this isn't a medical problem instead of a behavioural one. And I guess one way around it, if you're concerned about a bird being in the bottom of the cage all the time, you could see if you could put things at the top, right, to attract the birds to the higher parts of the cage, toys and food, right, and yeah. see if they'll go up. And if that, that changes the behaviour, then your bird is quite normal. Um, but like Dr. Tran said, if they're still hanging out on the bottom, maybe there's something else going on that you need to get your bird checked on. Interesting question. Yeah. Okay, and our next question is from Alicia. Should love birds come in pairs? And if one passes away, do I get another? And can I mix different species of birds together? Cool. Yeah, okay, this is a, yeah. another good question. Yes, yes. Love birds coming in pairs. Uh, just because they're always sold in pairs doesn't it's mean they have to necessarily... It's a very necessarily... common question that we get as well. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, look, love birds are, as a pet are uh, excellent um, on their own, okay? They can be. Um, keeping them in pairs can also be done. It's perfectly fine too. Um, lovebirds need to be, if you're going to keep a pair of lovebirds, you should do it early. You should introduce them as, yeah. as two birds early. If you introduce another bird later, they can be very aggressive. They may have love in their name, but it's not always by nature. They can be very territorial and they've got strong beaks. They can really hurt another new bird. Um, and additionally, mixing um, another species of bird with a lovebird, really wouldn't consider that. Um, they will fight birds much bigger than themselves and on top of that they uh, you know mixing them with something like a budgerigar or a cockatiel they can really hurt um, those guys which are a lot softer in nature so I normally wouldn't recommend mixing lovebirds with other small species particularly unsupervised okay um, but with respect to um, you know them being kept together they can be they can be kept separate um, as a pet but they require the right amount of attention and, and constant interaction if we're going to do that okay if they're kept as pairs, you need to make sure you're constantly uh, working with them and uh, engaging the birds every day. Otherwise, uh, they may just prefer their own company rather than being uh, interacting with you. So you need to take that into account as well, what you want out of the relationship with your birds. If one bird should pass away, um, to get another, it's possible to do, but for the reasons we've just discussed, um, it needs to be done very carefully, okay? Um, also, it's probably worth finding out why that bird passed away. You know, was there something... Uh, really wrong in terms of an infectious disease that uh, your remaining bird might still have uh, that could pass on to uh, a new bird coming in or vice versa. So I do think that you know you, you can look into uh, getting another bird but it may not be the same relationship yeah. and you want to make sure it's done yeah. safely and in a, a, a manner that's going to protect the health of both birds. And I guess just to add on to what Dr. Trent was saying if you are an owner looking to keep just one bird, um, now if you are someone working at home or you can you spend a lot of your your time at home, then you become your bird's social interaction. Then it's actually okay. So it's like I said, it's a misconception that all birds should come in pairs because they can come in singles um, as long as the owner provides the right amount of attention to the bird. Yeah. Okay, and now for our last question of today's webinar, a related question as well. What should I do if one of my love bird displays mating behavior? Cool, that is also a good question. <laughs> yeah. um, Certainly with, with lovebirds um, or any bird displaying mating behaviours, depends on who it's being displayed to and the settings of what you're trying to get out of it. If you're someone that's looking to breed pet lovebirds, uh, then okay, you can provide the... Yeah, 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 yeah. The birds, you don't have to do much other than provide the suitable environment for them to uh, successfully lay uh, their eggs and raise chicks. Um, but if that's not your intention, then you need to look at, um, you know, figuring out why they're um, doing that. So if they're displaying mating behaviours to another bird or to you, uh, ways we can trigger this uh, are providing the right conditions for the birds to start wanting to breed. Birds, uh, rather than us that go, you know, humans or other mammals that often just go through uh, hormonal cycles, uh, birds are triggered to reproduce through their environment. Okay, uh, If the conditions are right, they'll want to breed. So when 
we are looking at birds, very high amounts of um, daylight, so long photo period, we call it. Um, so reducing the number of hours for the bird can reduce the breeding activity. Uh, making sure they're not kept in constantly warm conditions can help reduce breeding activity. Um, making sure their diet is not full of uh, high fats and high carbohydrates uh, and excessively rich because uh, lots of energy intake can greatly um, uh, bolster that uh, reproductive activity and uh, normal hormonal function in birds. Okay. So these environmental factors need to be looked into uh, initially. Uh, following on from that, if they are already um, starting to lay eggs, um, shuffling the environment around um, so that they're not in the, a static environment that they're very comfortable in, if you make them a little bit more uncomfortable, uh, those birds will be uh, much better, uh, much more likely, I should say, to not want to breed anymore, okay? Um, there really are a range of techniques that you can use, but but the other thing we need to consider is if they start breeding um, excessively and females start laying lots of eggs, um, this can become a real health concern uh, for the hens, okay, uh, because it can draw a lot of their energy reserves, their calcium reserves, and make them very sick if we don't bring it under control. So putting some of these factors in place will really help, um, as well as we talked about some of that social interaction and social bonding problems with a pet bird that is overbonded to us. So reducing uh, that physical closeness um, and, and cuddling and scratching can help minimise some of that mating behaviour from our pet birds directed at us, us particularly. And we have, so we've come to the end of today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today. And also thank you very much, Dr. Jessica and Dr. Trent, for taking the time off to join us today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for and having us. If there are any questions that have not been answered, we'll get back to you after the end of the webinar. And we hope the webinar has been very useful for you guys. And see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. See you. Thank you.